So our first speaker to uh, begin the day is Matthew Battles, uh, the co-author of The Library Beyond the Book. Since 2012, he has been the associate director of the Meta Lab at Harvard, where he conducts research and writes about the role of technology in the arts, science, and humanities. And he has been uh, amongst those conceiving, planning, and leading the development of research projects uh, in media and publications. He has a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Chicago in Anthropology and a Master's in Creative Writing from Boston University. He began his career as a editor, writer, and publisher, first uh, at Houghton Library at Harvard, at MFA Publications, uh, as uh, editor at highlowbrow.com, which was named in 2010 one of the top 10 blogs uh, by Time Magazine. Um, at Harvard from 2012 to 2014, he was a fellow at the Berkman Center for Internet and Society. In 2012, he was a visiting professor in the Department of Romance Languages and Literatures, teaching a course on the fra on entitled Fragments of a Material History of Literature. Author of uh, many books, Library and Unquiet History, published by Norton in 2003, uh, and translated into Portuguese, Italian, German, Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. Widener, Biography of a Library, published 2004. The Sovereignties of Invention, Stories, published in 2012. The Library Beyond the Book, which I mentioned. And uh, in press, as we speak, Palimpsest, A History of the Written Word, uh, again published by Norton. Uh, and along with that, uh, many, many articles for a variety of publications. So it is a pleasure to welcome Matthew to the podium. And he will speak to us on the object in extremis. Welcome. Thank you for that introduction, Peter, and uh, and thank you for the invitation to be here. I'm I'm here uh, um, in in lieu of of my colleague and co-author Jeffrey Schnapp, um, uh, and when he discovered that he had. Um, a conflict uh, and couldn't be here, I was very excited. Um, the prospect of a symposium uh, on extreme conservation um, really, um, really uh, got my curiosity peaked immediately. Um, so I'm really pleased to be here and I'm excited for the program today. Um, I think in, in my kind of, kind of dilettantish way, there are little bits and pieces of um, many of the themes that will be picked up uh, over the course of the day in my presentation. Um, I'm a, a, a little bit interested in the forensic, um, which Peter just instanced, um, and, the, and the concern for the you know, irreducible quiddity of material objects um, in their cultural dimensions. Um, I've got a little bit of um, performance uh, in, in this, a little bit of living things, perhaps, uh, and, and a little bit of outer space. Um, so what I'm doing basically today is bringing together a few digital objects um, that manifest um, in, in, in a kind of spectrum of, of ways um, as material objects, as virtual objects, as, as technology, um, and as cultural objects. Um, in order to help us maybe think through some of the ways in which digital, digital objects are both different from and quite similar to uh, objects in material realms, um, connected to those objects uh, irreducibly, ineluctably, um, and to maybe offer some provocations for how that kind of theoretical disposition towards uh, digital objects uh, might inform uh, approaches to their conservation, um, to their preservation um, for the long durée. Um, so I should start by saying that, uh, um, uh, first of all, um, there will be a couple of digital objects over the course of this presentation, which I'm going to leave the presentation um, to play with. Uh, digital objects are very slick, except when they aren't, right? So if there are some little hiccups in moving back and forth from presentation mode to executable file and back again, please bear with me. Um, I think it'll be worth uh, the transition. Uh, this is a digital object. Um, that uh, we uh, made at Metal Lab. So, and I'll let this kind of run, this video run while I talk a little bit about Metal Lab and what we do. We are not a conservation lab, so um, our interests are kind of experimental, expressive, um, exploratory in nature. Uh, and uh, we uh, do make digital things. And for me, as a writer, um, uh, kind of critic and, and cultural historian uh, interested in, manifestly in cultures of collection uh, broadly defined. 
um, the opportunity over the last couple of years to be involved with making digital objects and uh, manifesting that making as a form of thinking and a form of knowledge production has really been a bracing experience. This is a, a video that's documenting um, a project we uh, undertook last year, about a year, started about a year and a half ago, called Teaching with Things. Um, and as many of you may know, uh, this is uh, the object represented here um, in the material world is an ostracon. Um, ostraca were, uh, one might call them the sort of post-it notes of the ancient world. Um, uh, they, they were potsherds um, upon which writing has been um, inscribed. And they were used for all kinds of e ephemeral writing um, throughout the ancient world for centuries. Um, used for the equivalent of shopping lists or recipes or um, notes to oneself, um, bills of sale. Um, they were used uh, substantially for voting um, in the ancient world. And in fact, our English word ostracism comes from the use of the ostracon um, in the process of ostracization in, uh, in ancient uh, Athens. Uh, so this uh, ostracon is, uh, well, the, the, um, the material avatar of this digital object um, is an item in the collection in Houghton Library at Harvard University, uh, where it's treated as a manuscript object. One of the interesting things about ostraca to me um, is a quality of these, of these objects that, it, that they share with many kinds of objects, which is that they're boundary objects. Um, they exist in, in different realms. They exist at the interstices of several different realms of knowledge production, um, of culture, um, of, of technical and material uh, demands and constraints as well. And depending on uh, the milieu they find themselves in as collected objects, they, they manifest quite differently, don't they? Um, in Houghton Library, this is a manuscript. Um, there are ostraca across the street in the Harvard Art Museum, um, which are treated as artifacts uh, with a kind of art historical um, uh, uh, paradigm. Uh, uh, a little bit further uh, uh, down the street at the Semitic Museum, ostraca are archaeological artifacts. Now, of course, in each of these contexts, those characteristics of each of those paradigms that are salient to the object are expressible, they're discoverable, they're manifest. Um, but at the same time, each of those contexts also manifests its, its own kind of cultural dispositions, its epistemic virtues with respect to, to that object. So in Houghton Library, the ostraca has um, a finding aid, as archival um, uh, texts are wont to have. Um, it's called, it's uh, described and cataloged much differently in other collections' contexts. So all of that preamble is a way of saying that teaching with things is a project that uh, is, is attempting to turn out digital objects uh, that are rela related to material objects in the form of 3D scans. So this is a, a scan that we made of an ostracon um, that, we, that we wanted to render um, as, a, as an annotatable object, as a kind of object that is also a text without transcribing it, um, without reducing it to the textual, uh, without at the same time reducing it to the merely material. Um, and, you know, so this is part of an interface that's an experimental interface. Um, we're still developing at Metalab to make a digital object like this um, relatable to its uh, material avatar and also to make it annotatable, um, uh, to make it a manipulable object. And you know, one of the things that we discover in the course of this is something that we really knew already, um, which is that uh, digital objects, too, have their materiality. Um, and the material object is by no means reducible to that digital realm wholly. Um, you cannot simply um, kind of create a kind of digital apotheosis uh, for the material object. Um, and so this is not a conservation project per se, but it's a kind of um, orientation, uh, uh, Meta Labs orientation um, to the material object and the digital. As a digital object, um, this, this scan, um, which is documented in a video here, demands a conservation treatment as well. Um, as we move forward in the project, we find already that as platforms obsolesce, um, as new technology emerges, as the cost and uh, efficacy of, of uh, kind of prosumer on the market scanning um, systems become more accessible, uh, uh, this object um, moves. Um, its life 
at, at, at the time it was coded um, and prototyped only just began in the same way that the statue uh, Margaret Yorsenar talked about um, just begins its life when it's created. So with these um, notions about the objectivity of the digital, the materiality of the digital in mind, um, I stumbled across uh, Auden's poem, Objects, recently. He wrote this in 1956, I think it appeared in the magazine Encounter, and this is it, it just uh, the second stanza of, of uh, a sonnet. Um, and Auden is talking about the kind of uncanny glamour of objects in the world, objects in our daily lives, and the way in which they stand at the, in this kind of strange, intimate, unfamiliar uh, relationship with us. Um, and I, I find this, this, this verse very, very curious and compelling. Um, this notion that their surfaces appear as deep as any longing we ever had, if shapes can so to their own edges keep, no separation proves a being bad. If shapes can so to their own edges keep. So it was with this uh, edge that Auden instances in mind um, when uh, I learned the, the title for this symposium, Extreme Conservation, um, that I started to think about edges and extremity. Uh, uh, and so often, um, we find objects pushed to their edges. And a lot of our digital work, I think, attends to edges, um, the edges of, of, of objects and their kind of avatars and the ways in which they kind of deciduate or throw off seeds into the world um, that render those edges fuzzy and uncertain. This is a manifest property of digital objects, I would argue. But it's a property that digital objects share with the material. Um, and uh, so as I look at some of these digital objects in the balance of my talk, um, I want to explore uh, the question of edges. Uh, where do the edges lie? What is the object to be conserved? Um, where do we find its borders? Uh, and what's the role of conservation in uh, defending those borders uh, exploiting those borders, exploring those borders, and exploring the connections that an object makes with other objects, the kinds of hyper-objects that result from these communities of objects of abiding interest and value. So I think with the digital object, we get this glamour, this kind of uncanny glamour of uh, the virtual, um, of, of the immaterial, um, from Alan Turing. And Turing is receiving um, a, a long delayed measure of uh, sort of, I think, um, fame and, and gratitude um, thanks to uh, the film about his work uh, in, in uh, decoding German, um, uh, the German Enigma machine code in World War II. But Turing is really a, a fascinating figure and, and so deeply impactful in terms of 21st century digital culture. Uh, and, and mostly, I would argue, not for that code-breaking work, uh, but for this paper, uh, which is the paper in which he imagines a, a machine that can, uh, that can calculate, that can compute. Uh, uh, it's a response to a problem in logic and, 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 and pure math, uh, a, a problem that has to do with the question of whether a calculation can be made, a, an equation can be created, an algorithm can be generated that could prove uh, uh, an assertion in a logical system true, prove an axiom true. Um, and what Turing did in this paper um, uh, was imagine a machine that could calculate any equation. Um, and what he found was this interesting uncanny um, circumstance that he couldn't actually prove that an algorithm could be um, formulated that would prove an axiom true within a value system, a, a, a logical system. But he did prove that you could build a machine that could run any of these calculations. And I think it's interesting that Turing manifests this fascination with um, objects that had a kind of uncanny dimension to them, that, um, that, that sort of sought to, in a sense, hide their essence. Um, there's something um, compelling and, and I think tragic, uh, given um, his, his biography, uh, given the persecution um, that he underwent, um, for being a gay man um, in the middle of the 20th century in Great Britain. Um, you know, his other famous paper uh, is about artificial intelligence. And that, too, is about um, a machine kind of um, taking on 
an uncanny guise of, uh, uh, of a material object, in the case of the artificial mind, a, a human. Um, so Turing was very interested in the kind of glamour of the virtual and the virtuality of the computational machine that he imagines is a fundamental quality of uh, the kind of paradigmatic machine um, that becomes a, a, a substantial part of what informs computer science, the balance of the 20th century in, into our own time. It's not the only piece of the computer by any means. Turing's machine uh, basically uh, uh, was, t was completely imagined. One was never built. They've been built by um, computer scientists since then as experiments. Uh, but as a thought experiment, he imagined a tape that had ones and zeros on it, and, those, and that tape could be moved forward and backward to create a binary code that would encode any number, encode any calculation. And that's a fundamental um, ingredient in uh, modern computer science, of course. There are other pieces of the computer that are not accounted for by Turing, but this is an important part of it. And it, and it leads to, I think, this uncanny condition of the digital object as a virtual object. Um, as a logical object, uh, as an object that's abstract in fundamental ways. But I think we also have to recognize, uh, and some of the objects that I'm going to get into, will they will all kind of manifest and demonstrate this property, that digital objects are in fact material objects as well. Not only are they material in the world, insofar as they instantiate in systems uh, that have material properties that behave according to the laws of the physical universe, uh, but the digital has its own kind of quiddity, has its own kind of vernaculars. Those vernaculars are responsive to culture as well, and so it's finally important for us to recognize that digital objects are always already cultural objects as well. Because of that first property, that, that property that descends from Turing, um, uh, at least as its kind of avatar or objective correlative, um, it's easy for us to be mystified by the glamour of the virtual. Uh, and I think there's a great deal of that mystification that goes on in digital culture today. But the materiality and the cultural quiddity of these objects are important, fundamental um, to their nature, to their operation in the world, to their operation um, as, as uh, entities. And uh, they need to be attended to um, in terms of the curatorial um, approach to the object and in terms of their conservation and preservation as well. Oops. So I'm going to start out with um, a number of digital objects that kind of change in scale as I go forward. Um, and this first one is arguably not a digital object at all. Does anybody recognize this? I'm not surprised. Um, this is a, a line of code. It's in fact a program. It's an entire computer program. Uh, it's in, it's in um, BASIC. Uh, it's in Commodore 64 BASIC in particular. Um, uh, a, a version of the basic programming language that was created for the Commodore computer, which wasn't the first uh, universal Turing machine by any means, but it's probably the first that many of us encountered in the early 80s, um, when it was for a time, and, and in fact I think remains, the best-selling single personal computer model of all time. Um, completely gone today. Uh, an, an artifact that has a very kind of peculiar set of constraints, technically and materially. Um, and yet it was one that introduced so many people um, to the possibilities of the personal computer. So what's going on here? Well, this is, I, I call this a digital object, and it is, of course, in a sense, a digital object. I mean, it is a, a piece of uh, digital electronic text. Uh, it's, a, it's encoded text. It's a typeface um, that, it has, that manifests as a digital avatar on the screen. It's also... Um, at the same time, a line of text. I mean, it's an actual text. And as I, as I hope to demonstrate, um, it is a legible, it's a, it's a readable text, a human readable text. Um, and what it isn't right now in its concurrent instantiation on the screen um, is a digital object in a sense uh, in which it was intended. Um, it's not ready to be executed as code right now on the screen. Um, so what's going on here? Well, this is a, a, a one-line program um, from uh, a kind of um, a cultural movement in uh, sort of early uh, home computer hobbyist milieu, um, the one-line computer program. Uh, there was a, a kind of, there's an aesthetic to 
um, developing one-line computer programs that can manifest interesting, surprising, beautiful properties that can do things with sound, that can do things with imagery, that can do things with pattern and, and typefaces on, on the computer screen. Um, and it was quite a rich kind of cultural milieu, and it, it, there's, there's still, to a certain extent today, people who are writing in, um, in basic um, and other kind of um, media archaeological computer languages of the past, one-line programs. This program in particular, though, is kind of the canonical one. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about, about how and why that is. Uh, shortly. Um, and I want to say that um, to cite uh, this book, this book, Ten Print, uh, uh, it's actually the title of the book is this, this line of code. Um, uh, published by the MIT Press uh, last year, uh, written by Nick Monford, who's a professor at MIT, um, a poet and, uh, and computer scientist, um, uh, and the head of a, a, an electronic uh, literature program at MIT centered in what he calls the Trope Tank, which is a, um, a research center that, that also has a collection of early computers. Uh, Tenprint is, is um, it's a wonderful piece of work on this single line of code in its technical and, uh, uh, and uh, cultural manifestations. Um, the, the, the book is um, co-authored by 10 authors. Uh, they look variously at uh, the, the history of, of basic and one-line programming in the early kind of hobbyist computer, uh, uh, home computer movement. Um, they read intensively this single line of code as a text. It's a close reading of this, of this uh, single line of code. Um, and in that way, it's very different from a lot of work in the digital humanities today that focuses on kind of the telescopic view that looks at big data. Uh, that, that manifests views at the collection level uh, or even more comprehensive levels um, of the, the kind of collocation and analysis and visualization of data. Um, Monfort and his colleagues here look very intensively at this one line of code. And what I'd like to do actually, um, so this is what the Commodore um, uh, 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 screen looks like. And I'm going to move to an emulator of this in a little while. But first, I, I want to talk about the preservation of the objects that are required to run these kinds of code. So that's what a Commodore 64 looks like, and that's a Commodore 64 in the trope tank at MIT. And uh, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a quite um, kind of unfamiliar object to work with today, um, although this was the first computer that I uh, interacted with as a young person in the mid-1980s. Uh, it, uh, it has a kind of alien um, alterity uh, that's much different from the devices we're used to today. Um, Monfort and, and colleagues um, have mounted a series of exhibitions uh, of one line or very short programs intended to explore the expressive uh, uh, aesthetic qualities of these programming languages uh, and the machines that run these programming languages as well. Um, but one thing that's interesting about this, this realm um, of the aesthetic and cultural dimensions of the personal computer and of technology generally. This extends to platform games and, um, and console games uh, from the 1980s and 90s arcades um, and across technological domains uh, is, is that because of that uh, kind of hybrid multiple manifestation as virtual, as material, and as cultural objects, uh, we need not only to attend to the physical preservation of these objects, but their technological preservation as well. And one way that's done, and this is reminding us of that single line of code, is through emulation. Um, emulation is, is uh, the, the practice of building virtual machines within computers that run like um, other computers, that run like earlier computers. Uh, so you can uh, develop a, a program um, for a laptop or a, or a desktop computer of today, of the 21st century, that will run like a Commodore 64 of 1982. And there's a, a kind of really active um, vernacular culture of emulation in, um, in technological realms, in, in kind of hacker spaces. Uh, people have for a long time been intrigued by the, the kind of expressive work, um, the, the kind of hacking and, and experimentation of creating these emulation systems. Um, and so what you end up with in an emulator is a virtual um, 
world within a world. Um, for the emulation system, uh, the universe ends in this uncanny way at the edges of my, of my laptop. Um, and yet, as far as the emulation is concerned, it, it's, it's manifesting in this kind of, um, in this kind of uncanny present, uh, where it's both 2015 and 1982. Um, uh, and emulation has, I, I think, some compelling um, uh, implications for conservation practice uh, some compelling philosophical dimensions as well, which we'll get into in a moment. But what I'm going to do actually here at this moment is take us to an emulator. Let's see if I can get this going. So here is an emulator running um, of the Commodore 64 uh, uh, basic uh, uh, programming environment. Um, and uh, so this computer thinks it's a Commodore 64 right now. And what I'm going to do is put, is put that line of, of, of code in here. I kind of have to look... Let me make sure I'm in this. All right, so I'm going to make sure that I'm in here. Good. Okay, so I'm going to put this line of code in here. Ten print. I have to remember it. All right. Plus. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what these elements are. Make sure I get all of these in place. Okay, so now that's that's right, I think. No, nope, it's not. The uh, computer is a very rigorous editor, and it won't let me get things wrong. So now I'm going to tell it to run. So this is what the 10 print CHR dollar sign, et cetera, line of code does. It creates this, um, this kind of diagonal maze. Um, and by varying that line of code a little bit, um, one can create different kinds of patterns. So I'm going to put this line of code in here again and talk just a little bit about what it does. Okay, so this is an interesting text to me. Um, uh, the 10 is the, the first line of code, and there was a convention that emerged in early computer programming to, um, to, to number lines of code so you could find your way back to them. And to number them in tens, so if you decided you needed more lines of code between two lines, you didn't need to renumber the whole. Um, so what's interesting about this is it's not really necessary in a single line of code um, to have that 10 there. Um, uh, and yet, by convention, it's there. This is purely a kind of um, scribal practice, as it were, to put the 10 in place here. It's also a scribal practice to put the, 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 P, the, the space after the 10, the space after the print, and other spaces that I've used as well. The computer, in this case, the basic uh, programming environment, doesn't need those spaces, but they're there for us. Um, and one finds, no matter how complicated, no matter how vast, the digital object, no matter how many lines of code, no, many, no matter how many databases it calls on, media assets it generates or divides, um, no matter how many algorithms it runs and analyses it promulgates, um, it is also full of these traces of scribal practice, these traces of epistemic virtue. Um, what else is going on here? The, the CHR is, uh, is a function uh, that is asking for a character. It says what comes after this. Uh, in the parentheses, should, it's going to be a number, but I want you, computer, to turn it into a character. 205.5 is that character. In fact, it's 205 and 206 uh, that are the characters in the ASCII character set. You'll recall ASCII, that 128 character, very simple, plain text character encoding. Um, that comes from telegraphy. So we're interacting here with the cultural history of technology that reaches back um, to the mid-19th century. Uh, when we're dealing with ASCII character codes. Uh, what the computer is actually doing here is trying to split the difference between two character codes, 205 and 206. The 205 is, uh, is the, the kind of right bending diagonal, and the 206 is the left bending diagonal. And so what I'm doing is telling the computer to print those characters to the screen and to decide randomly, stochastically, 
which one to print. If I left that just as 205.5 and didn't include the random argument after it, uh, it would round down to 205. Um, so all I would get would be the right bending uh, brackets. Um, if I put 205.6, it would round up to 206. So I add this random function. Random is an interesting uh, concept in the computer because it's actually not really random. It's not generating a random number. It's pulling from um, a random number table, um, a, a set of numbers that manifest randomness but are actually the same set of numbers every time. Uh, so basically what it's doing is, is by adding the random number from that random number table to which is a number less than one, that's what the one is doing there. It's asking for a random number less than one. By adding that one to the 205.5, I'm getting either 205 or 206 every time. And that random pattern of left and right um, diagonals generates this maze. Uh, and then at the very end, it says go to 10, which is saying go back to 10 and start over again and just keep doing that. Um, so in this one line of code, I should say the print, too, is an interesting manifestation of the cultural history of technology insofar as, of course, nothing is printed in the way we think of it here, right? It's printing to the screen. Um, but of course, when BASIC was formulated, um, uh, computer programmers were working at teletype workstations that actually printed. They didn't have screens. They had paper in a teletype machine. Um, and so if I were doing this um, in the 1970s, I very likely would have typed this out, and when I hit um, print, it would print it on a, on a piece of paper on a teletype machine. And so we still use that term, both in, in code and obviously to print uh, paper documents, um, as a manifestation of that um, uh, teletype, which brought, in a sense, writing and scribal uh, and printing modalities to computer science where they had not been before. So in this single line of code, um, we're manifesting all kinds of cultural history, all kinds of um, epistemic virtues of computer scientists, of programmers, of hobbyists, um, and, uh, uh, and aesthetics as well. Uh, simply creating this as one line of code is a kind of aesthetic operation. It's, it's an assertion. It's a gambit, right? And in fact, that go to 10 line could just as easily be put on another line of code as line 20 or line 12 or line 11. Um, and the computer wouldn't mind. Uh, but it's uh, a rhetorical device used here for aesthetic purposes. So m my point in kind of exploring this single line of code uh, at this level is, is simply to ask, what is the digital object in this? What is the object to be conserved here? Is it the single line of code? Is it the, uh, the Commodore 64 computer in the trope tank, which came in several editions and flavors over time? Um, is it the emulator? Uh, one of the striking things about the emulator, I'll bring back my, um, bring back my presentation. So one of the striking things about emulation is that it's also a forensic um, exploration of the digital object. Uh, by, by emulating the object, you're um, forced into encounter at a very deep and intimate level um, with the way that object is put together. And so emulation becomes not only a way um, to explore virtually uh, the kind of um, affordances of the digital object, but to, um, to get under the hood, as it were, and, and examine it forensically as well. Emulation, however, is in the conservation and preservation of digital objects, not without controversy. Um, there are kind of two stances in uh, the world of the conservation of digital objects. Um, one adhering more to a preservation paradigm and one adhering more to an emulation paradigm. One place where emulation is very strong is with the Internet Archive. Um, the Internet Archive, uh, based in San Francisco, is founded by Brewster Kale, um, a technologist himself who decided that it was time to start digitizing everything. Um, and uh, the Internet Archive has, has just run pell-mell forward with digitization, digitization of educational film, of books, um, of photographs. They work now with many institutional um, uh, sites of collection. Uh, and they've nearly 20 years uh, have passed since the Internet Archive started this digitization campaign, this kind of comprehensive digitization campaign. And Brewster and his colleagues um, are just beginning to turn to uh, a, a kind of curatorial 
perspective on the collections they've developed. They're beginning to ask, how do we use this stuff? What do we use it for? How do we tell stories with it? How do we make arguments with it? So it's a very interesting time. One of the new collections at the Internet Archive is this collection of 1980s console games, arcade games, um, called the Internet Arcade. And it's uh, the project of a really interesting and dynamic kind of um, vernacular uh, archivist by the name of Jason Scott. Um, Jason Scott is quite a charismatic um, uh, persona, uh, fascinating guy, who kind of came to prominence in um, technology and digital preservation uh, arenas uh, for his work archiving um, text files from early internet bulletin board services. Um, this was a form of, uh, of networked textuality very early in the history of the internet. Um, and uh, full of all kinds of things from piracy to um, fantasy, uh, to gaming, to hacking, to code breaking, um, to science and technology studies um, that, that Jason has sought to preserve um, in textual form. But he's also been preserving um, arcade games from the 80s and 90s. And he's been preserving them as emulated games, not as standing games in cabinets. Um, he developed a system uh, an emulation system that will uh, kind of suck in the code from an old game and turn it into a playable web version of the game. And there are some in the kind of in the world of, of, of people who take an interest in arcade games from the last century um, who find this controversial, who find it problematic. Um, he, he has uh, uh, emulated hundreds and hundreds of these games. And you know, it looks quite antic um, and, and, and fey to a certain extent, but Jason makes a very persuasive case that these are objects of, of, of great abiding cultural interest. Um, they, uh, they instance moments in design thinking, um, in, in uh, the aesthetics of product design, of interaction design, of notions of what a, a game is, what a computer is, what technology is. And furthermore, Jason argues that by emulating these systems, um, you dive deeply into the workings of them. Not only the workings of them as a kind of interface or experience for a young kid with a roll of quarters, uh, but also the pizza place owner or the arcade vendor, um, the game distributor, uh, because these objects had interfaces for those people as well, interfaces that manifest the epistemic virtues of commercial contexts, of small business, um, also early dives into what we think of as big data now. Um, that pizza place owner could keep track of which levels of a game took the longest for players to, to win and could adjust those levels um, to, to uh, suit his, his audience. Um, there's a lot that you could learn about your customers from these games very early in a way that's an uncanny kind of precursor of the concerns we have about privacy and surveillance in the context of social media today. So by emulating these games, you can dive into the, the design and the, and the operation of those technical systems in ways that become difficult as the objects themselves, as material objects, senesce and obsolesce and become difficult to manipulate um, as material objects in the world. Um, I visited the Internet Archive and talked to Jason and he said something that was really arresting to me about this question of emulation. We were walking through the space and we passed this big rack of, um, uh, of video uh, editing decks from the 70s and 80s, uh, part of the um, material infrastructure for digitizing um, early, early video that's a big part of the Internet Archive's um, collection strategy. And I said, so what are you going to do with all these machines? Um, because they seem to want preservation as well. And he said something that was both kind of um, compelling but also chilling. Um, the compelling part was he kind of waved his hands at the, at the interfaces, the, the knobs and dials and controls and um, uh, uh, meters on the surfaces of these um, machines and said, you know, all of these controls represent relationships, relationships between human beings, relationships between humans and the objects that they're manipulating with these machines. And once we have, that was the part that was compelling. And the chilling part, but it's also compelling is what he said next, which is once we've emulated those, we'll understand those relationships, uh, we'll have documented those relationships, and we won't need the machines anymore. So that's Jason's kind of digital 
extremity with respect to the relationship between the digital object and its material avatars. But not everybody in the preservation of technology uh, is of the same mind by any means. Um, and so I'm moving to a new object. Um, some of you may recognize this object. It is um, uh, one uh, documentation of Agrippa, uh, which is a poem that was um, produced uh, in 1992 by William Gibson, uh, an author, a science fiction author, cyberpunk um, progenitor, uh, uh, still active today. Um, and it was, it was a, an, a book that was meant to destroy itself, fundamentally. A 300-line poem, semi-autobiographical poem, uh, which the poem is contained on the disc. Um, the, the rest of the object um, is, is a book made by Dennis Ashbaugh, uh, artist, book artist Dennis, Dennis Ashbaugh, um, printed with photosensitive uh, inks, um, manifesting a, a, a DNA genome. It's not an actual genome. Um, but it looks like one, uh, and and a series of images meant to look like sort of the, the kind of gel um, electrophoresis of DNA. Um, but the idea was that being printed in photosensitive chemicals, as soon as you began to operate this book, perform it as a book, these pages would begin to fade. And similarly, the disk was allegedly encrypted in such a way that um, a as you as you uh, ran the disk to read the poem on a Macintosh System 7 operating system computer, a Mac classic, as it were, circa 1992, um, the poem would encrypt itself and render itself um, uh, out of reach uh, of, of readers. So the contention, the gambit of this project um, of Ashbaugh and, and Gibson was to create a cultural object that, would, that was ephemeral by design, that would destroy itself. Um, and, and this was in dialogue with, as I'm sure many of you will recall, some of the kind of primary debates of the sort of early age of digital culture, debates that are still with us today about the ephemerality of digital objects. Um, one of the interesting things about this object is, of course, it proved to be anything but completely ephemeral. Many manifestations of this book exist today. And in particular, um, uh, the author Matthew Kirschenbaum, scholar Matthew Kirschenbaum at the University of Maryland, uh, has undertaken a kind of um, scholarly editing project to recover the traces of Agrippa as uh, a digital object and a, a, and a material text as well, looking for um, hacked copies of it that survived that supposed encryption uh, event, uh, looking for um, traces of the material book, looking to reunite those, looking also at documentation from 1992 in the form of video and in the form of emulation as well. Um, Kirschenbaum is a really interesting figure um, and I think a crucial one for understanding the materiality of the digital. Um, his book, uh, Mechanisms, um, is a kind of um, exploration of a forensic approach to electronic text. Um, and he's informed by this notion that comes from the father of forensic science, really S Edmond Lucard, who's kind of thought of as a sort of French Sherlock Holmes, 20th century um, uh, uh, figure in, in French um, criminal justice, who, uh, who's, who's kind of grand theory was that every contact in the world leaves a trace, that nothing um, ever moves without, without leaving some evidence, some residue behind. One of the reasons this becomes so important to Kirschenbaum is because this is so manifestly the case with digital objects. Um, digital objects are, which are want to be virtual and immaterial are nonetheless, in many ways, more prone to leave traces than many material objects are. Um, every time you interact with a digital object, it changes, or it changes something outside of it. Um, there's a register uh, 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 noted in a log somewhere. Um, a code changes, a date changes. Every time you interact with a word processing file on your computer or a website, somewhere that interaction is registered. And the gathering back together of those disparate traces as they're sewn in the world is a forensic property. And so Kirschenbaum kind of invites us to or um, uh, extols us to uh, 
uh, uh, manifest a kind of forensic imagination about digital objects. Um, and, and to instantiate that as a practice, as an archival practice, as an editorial practice, as a preservation practice in the world as well. So one of Kirschenbaum's um, projects is this Agrippa Files, um, uh, uh, a Mellon-funded project to recover the traces of Agrippa. Uh, and it, it, it's, a, it's a project in kind of digital and material scholarly editing that crosses modes of conservation and preservation, modes of scholarly editing, editorial practice, and emulation as well. And at the Agrippa Files um, website, there are emulators that will let you experience a version of the poem as it might have felt on a, on a Macintosh computer of the early 1990s. Uh, the text is, is available as a, a, a readable text on the screen. Um, and there's a great deal of documentation, uh, both bibliographic documentation of where instances of this book ended up, um, uh, of ways in which it was hacked or pirated or copied, um, reproduced. Uh, and so it's a, it's a kind of hybrid composite preservation editorial project. Um, that manifests an understanding of the irreducible materiality of this, um, this text that wanted so badly, um, if authorial intention is, is any guide, to uh, render itself immaterial. So there's this curious property that I think we're beginning to see in these objects, that digital objects must be used to be preserved. Um, if you leave that Mac classic in the attic, I had this funny moment when Steve Jobs died, and this funny kind of sentimental moment where I went up into the attic and got my Mac Classic computer from the 1990s and brought it down and plugged it in. And, and, and it sort of started, but it, then it sort of died. <laughs> and, uh, and I was so sad, you know? Um, and that's happening in attics all over the world, isn't it? Um, so through the use, not only the use of the, of the, of the artifacts, of the tools, um, uh, as, as historical artifacts, but also through emulation. Um, we, we keep these things alive by their use. But interestingly, because of that forensic irreducibility, because of the, the ways in which digital objects are always leaving traces, always changing themselves, um, digital objects, as they're used, they cannot be conserved. There's no way to kind of fix these things in amber, um, ultimately, uh, in any kind of usable way. I mean, we could, you know, um, uh, uh, forge a, a kind of titanium plaque of 10 print and eject it into space. But as I think the emulation um, experiment showed, crucial aspects of that object would be missing from that plaque um, and irrecoverable because the irreducible materiality of the Commodore 64 computer um, would be fundamentally missing um, as it makes its way through the galaxy. So these are a couple of provocations to think about with respect to digital objects in the world. Um, and so now I'm getting into space, and I wanted to, to touch on just a couple, of, a couple more objects very quickly. Um, uh, and in this, I'm probably uh, uh, giving a kind of preview of, um, of things to come today. But this is going to be a very glancing preview, uh, and we have a deeper dive into uh, the artifactuality of the space program. Uh, to look forward to. But this is the Apollo Guidance Computer Interface, um, the so-called DISCI um, interface that was developed by the Instrumentation Lab at MIT during the Apollo program. An extraordinary um, object in the history of digital technology and the history of the computer. It's been well described, I think, in particular by the historian of technology, uh, uh, David Mendel at MIT, whose book Digital Apollo um, explores the kind of unfolding of these um, incredibly complex programs um, uh, of developing the technology for this, the space program, for, for Apollo in particular. Um, I'm particularly interested right now for present purposes in the code, uh, the programs that, that were run on this computer, of which this is just the interface. Um, uh, this is kind of what the code looks like. Uh, this is a web version of the text on the web at ibiblio.org. Um, there's a great deal of emulation and preservation there of um, Apollo uh, digital uh, uh, textuality. Um, these, all of these blue texts are linkable to the programs they represent. This is kind of a list of all the programs. This is the kind of main uh, program that tells the computer where to go to find the other programs. 
Um, but this is not the form in which this code would have been represented um, circa 1967, 1968. Um, this is one version of that code, uh, the, the, the books of the so-called rope listings, and I'll tell you why they're called rope listings in a moment, um, that, uh, uh, that uh, kind of document the code. This is, of course, not an executable file. You can't run the code from this book. Um, here's uh, Margaret Hamilton, who is the lead uh, 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 software designer for the Instrumentation Lab, a pioneering uh, woman in computer science, uh, standing next to the stack of these rope listings, representing in one form a visualization of the complexity, or at least the, 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 uh, the, the size, the sheer magnitude of the code that was produced for the Apollo guidance computer. Um, but of course, you know, the actual uh, manifestation of this code as executable programming took other material forms as well. It was encoded on the punch cards. Those punch cards were compiled on mainframe computers, and then ultimately, um, these programs were manifest in this form, this material form, as uh, core rope memory. And this is indeed a kind of actual rope. This is, this is the memory of the Apollo guidance computer, a piece of it, it's not the whole thing. Um, but essentially these are, are kind of textiles woven of metal wires. The wires weave in and out of, of, of little um, donuts, little metal donuts. If you go outside, it's a zero. If you go through it, it's, it's a one. And so once the code was compiled, um, it was generated as a rope listing which went to an actual um, retired textile worker in Massachusetts um, who then wove these ropes, wove the programs, okay? That's the program. <laughs> That's the program as far as the computer's concerned. Um, and, and so then the, the rope was delivered to the instrumentation lab, plugged into the computer, and run, and debugged, and if there was a problem, they had to go get a new rope wove. Um, so this was an irreducibly material digital object. Where is the object to be conserved in all of this? One of the interesting things about the iBiblio site is there is an emulation of the Apollo guidance computer. There are many emulations of the Apollo guidance computer available now. Um, uh, uh, but that's just one manifestation. And what's extraordinary to me about this is that ultimately, um, in order to make this Thing preservable, conservable, um, you have to acknowledge the extent to which a digital object like the Apollo guidance computer is a kind of performance. Um, and I think that that recognition, and this, this comes out of David Mendel's work um, visualizing um, the, the, um, the kind of imbrication of, of computer programs and navigational systems and control systems on the planet and communication systems in the actual moment of landing the lunar lander in the Apollo 11 mission. Um, you get this kind, of, this kind of operatic performance of all of these actors, digital, material, human, um, interdigitated with each other. And the way in which all of these things we've been looking at, you think about the one line of computer code and how many systems it requires to emulate that on my machine um, you think about Agrippa and the many manifestations of that across material and digital domains. These are performances, these objects. Um, they, they don't have um, easily recognizable edges. I was going to play a visualization of this kind of performance. I, don't, I think I'm running out of time for that. How much time do I have? Yeah, okay, okay. I, I should probably go on, but I'm happy to show this. Um, uh, uh, visualization of the uh, Apollo communications um, uh, system uh, uh, created by David Mendel with a, a, a former colleague of mine at Metalab, Yanni Lukisas, who's now at Georgia Tech, um, uh, it, which really points up the, the performative nature. And I say performance not only because there's a kind of theoretical kind of frisson in calling a digital object a performance, a kind of theatrical performance, but I think that may have, I think that may have implications with respect to conservation and the curatorial address of these objects as well. Because if they are performances, then we have things to learn from performance studies and from the documentation of performance. Um, and I think that many aspects of these um, curatorial projects like iBiblio and like David Mendel's visualization and documentation, scholarly documentation of the Apollo program um, have aspects respond to performance studies in interesting ways. I've got one more digital object that I want to show you, and this obviously is uh, only uh, a digital object insofar as it's a digital image, at least in the first instance. But um, 
I'm sure somebody in this room recognizes this painting. It's Veronese's Wedding at Cana. Um, and you'll notice that very few people are looking at this painting. It's, it's, this is in the Louvre. It's the largest painting in the Louvre. It's like the size of a squash court. Um, like I've ever played squash, anyway. Um, uh, but nobody's really, look, not many people are looking at it. It's, it's really probably the most important, least looked at painting in the Louvre because it shares space with this painting. <laughs> and it shares space with this painting, of course, because it was um, spirited away from, from Venice by Napoleon um, and, and taken back to France, and Venice has been trying to get it back ever since. It, it, it was on this, this island, San Giorgio Maggiore, um, an island which was the site of a Benedictine monastery at the time, with a Palladian refectory for which Veronese designed the painting. Um, uh, and, uh, and the painting was really designed for that refectory quite, quite specifically. It, it, it sort of was designed to fit at, at the end of, of the room and to be elevated on top of a kind of proscenium um, uh, and to be viewed from below in this way. And although you can't really tell from this photo from the Louvre, it's now got a frame around it, which, which it did not when Veronese installed it. Um, at San Giorgio, uh, and it's also at floor level now, and, and it's also, nobody's looking at it. So, um, of course, very few people got to see it when it was here in the refectory either. Um, but it does have a manifestation today um, in the refectory. Here's the refectory as it looks today, rather austere space, but beautiful space, uh, on the island of San Giorgio. San Giorgio is now the home of um, uh, the Fondazione Giorgio Cini, a, a, a kind of cultural foundation in Venice. Um, and uh, the foundation has been trying since uh, the middle of the 20th century um, to get the painting back to Venice. Um, Andre Malraux, rather famously, before he became the culture minister of France, said that he thought it ought to be returned, um, rather famously for anybody who's paying attention to this. <laughs> uh, but then when he became cultural minister, he said, well, it's, I, I can't really, that, that's not going to happen. So it's still in the Louvre, and it will remain in the Louvre. Uh, and so Bruno Latour, uh, an anthropologist of technology, a um, sort of pioneer in the field of science and technology studies, um, who's, who's worked with the, the Cini Foundation quite a bit, I, I believe it was Latour who first suggested that a, a digital facsimile be generated. Um, and so the Cini Foundation uh, worked with um, Factum Arte, uh, um, a digital design and conservation um, shop in, in Barcelona and Madrid, um, run by Adam Lowe, who's pictured there looking at the painting, um, uh, to create this, this facsimile. This facsimile is, is printed by large, high-resolution image setters on sized canvas. Um, close up, it's very difficult to tell that it's not a painting. Um, it's, it's, it's really a facsimile that's very nearly um, uh, uh, um, almost a hoax. <laughs> um, it's, it's a remarkable object. And it was created by digital means. Um, I'm going to play as I finish talking about this. Um, some video documentation of, uh, uh, of an installation that the filmmaker Peter Greenaway made when the, uh, the, the facsimile was unveiled um, in San Giorgio in 2008. Um, uh, so this is, this is not, the painting does not do this. It is, this, this digital object is a material object. It doesn't have any interactive affordances. This is all projection that Greenway has designed. Um, but the facsimile now is in the refectory, um, sans frame, uh, on top of the proscenium, in the kind of light that uh, one wants to see it in. Um, it's a project that prompts really fascinating questions about the nature of the material object, the nature of the digital object, the nature of preservation and facsimile and copy. Um, it, it is in its own right um, a magnificent um, uh, charismatic object, uh, distinct from uh, its connection to the painting in the Louvre. Um, and yet it's a, a, a troubling and, and, and problematic charisma that I think it, it exerts. Um, Adam Lowe, uh, the leader of Factum Arte, who developed the technology that made it possible to generate this, this object, calls it a performance of the Veronese. So there again you have this notion of performance, manifestly with 
with Greenaway's project, it's a performance. But the painting itself is a kind of gambit, a kind of conjecture about the nature of the connections between the material and the virtual realm, between the, um, the a painting and its, and its surrogate and its avatars. I wish I had been there to see this um, happen. So just to wrap up, remembering that Auden poem, we've seen a lot of objects that don't seem to have edges. And rather than saying that this is a um, unique quality of the digital, I want to argue that it's a quality the digital shares with material objects. And one of the salutary things that um, a conservation approach to the digital may afford us um, as far as a theoretical disposition goes, is the notion that, in fact, objects do not to their edges keep. So in terms of sort of provocations for conservation, I'd like to trouble the, um, the distinction between preservation and emulation and see them rather than kind of a bicamerality, kind of a mutual exclusivity, um, as elements on a spectrum of address to digital objects. I think the importance of Kirschenbaum's notion of the forensic imagination is is crucial to the conservation address of digital objects, um, to look at a digital object and understand it as, as something that manifests these kind of vagrant and um, migratory connections to objects in the physical world as well. And finally, to see these objects as performances. Um, we call programs scripts, and I think there's a deep connection there. It's not merely a formal connection. Um, but every time I've changed this Every time I've used this uh, presentation, I've changed it, whether or not I've added a slide or edited or not. And understanding each of those instances as performances worthy of a kind of provisional documentation, understanding that it can never be complete, um, never be canonical, um, I think is a crucial step to take in the conservational address of the digital object. And I'd like to think that those separations do not prove a being bad, as Auden fears in his poem. And with that, I'll conclude. Thank you very much. Matthew, thank you very much.